seminar that that Leonardo and I um, started at ISOM last semester. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Yeah, so uh, just like last semester, we will we'll have a five minute break in the middle and we will make sure to make it at least five minutes uh, this semester. So you can actually count on getting up and uh, get back in time to, to not miss uh, uh, the talk. Um, yeah, and I, I guess that's about it. Um, to, today, we are happy to introduce the, the first speaker of this semester, Ravi Vakil, speaking about bot periodicity, algebra geometrically. Um, next week, we will have Carl uh, Lian speaking about table of degrees. Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. We, we have talks every other week, approximately. Thanks, Leonardo. Yeah, so and a special encouragement from Ravi. He likes questions. Um, but anyway, um, please go ahead, Ravi. Thanks. So, so thank you very much. Thanks for having this seminar and for inviting me. And also, uh, maybe this is a late appreciation for ISERM, where I, because it's harder for me to travel, I really appreciated having this that great course semester where I could take part fully without traveling or reasonably fully. So thank you, Anders and Leonardo, for the, this as well. I um, because I'm I am traveling on Mondays usually. I normally will miss a number of these seminars at least this fall. So hopefully I'll be able to catch some if it continues. So uh, great. So I I have an hour and I and so I'd like to tell you about some work separately with uh, Hannah Larson and then Jim Bryan. Uh, and uh, this, I, I'm, I really am enjoying this because this work, because it's at, uh, it's a kind of, it's in the part of mathematics I like, which is where this seminar is located as well, which is where it's kind of the crossroads of several fields where um, different subjects all converge. And I know about some of them and I don't know about others. And this allows me to see a lot of things I would not otherwise see and talk to people I would not otherwise talk to. So, and the tricky thing I think is I will want to pull in things that much of that, uh, that any member of the audience might not necessarily have seen. So please do stop me because I do want, I, I think this is actually quite, I think the, the subject is comprehensible so long as you're willing to uh, hear a few words you may not have known before. Okay, so let me, let, let me go right into it. Uh, so let me, so what is bot periodicity? I know we're not, topologists here, most of us. Uh, and so it's, I'll say just enough to get it across. It's one of the fundamental results in topology and, and K-theory, one of the foundational results of K-theory. Uh, and it's so fundamental that it looks like it comes from algebraic geometry. That should be some, some algebra geometric result. Jim is smiling now because he feels like I'm, I don't mean this that algebraic geometry rules everything, although that may be the case. It's just that the statement is not topological. It's sort of even more, uh, it's even more blunt uh, and, and less sophisticated than topological. So uh, you may have heard of it in the following context, which is not algebra geometric. So for example, if you have the infinite orthogonal group and it doesn't really matter what that is, um, then you can write down its homotopy groups and they repeat mod eight every eight. And I wrote down the first eight and then it repeats after that. Uh, and uh, okay, so that's something infinite, but if you have a O100 oh, uh, uh, orthogonal group in 100 dimensional space, and that approximates O infinity. And so it repeats mod eight for a while and then it, then it breaks off, it doesn't continue. So uh, Bob Periodicity says that in, in one of its many meanings is that these groups, uh, when they're finite, behave nicely, but they get ni more nicely behaved as the groups get big. Uh, and then and there's this, furthermore, there's this repeating behavior. Okay, but more fundamentally, it's the following thing, which I'm, which is gonna be more relevant for us, but I will explain it soon. So I wanted to show you these diagrams. So uh, more fundamentally, it's about spaces. And I won't say exactly what spaces are yet or what we're gonna talk about yet, uh, but we have the, the infinite unitary group U. And again, don't worry about uh, the details of this right yet. Uh, uh, and so we, uh, and when we take, uh, there's a space called U, a space called BU, and there are various spaces here, O is the orthogonal group and SB is symplectic. Uh, and when you take what are called base loops, uh, and a base loop uh, is a map uh, into, our, into our space by a circle with a chosen point, uh, and a chosen point asked to go to a chosen point here, the identity of the group. So we have a space of such things, and the space of loops into U is supposed to be BU. 
in the space of what's going to be you is supposed to be you. And when I say supposed to be, I mean is, is. And when I say is, I mean homotopic to. Topologically, they are the same thing. So I don't really mean is. But much of mathematics is about figuring out what you mean by the word is. And so um, what they call complex spot periodicity I, is, is this thing here. It's a twofold periodicity. Loops one of U is BU. Loops one of BU is U. And then uh, real bot periodicity is this eightfold thing. I actually have no idea why one is called complex, one is called real. I know people, someone knows in the audience, don't tell me. Uh, tell me later, I, I'm, uh, it's not gonna matter just yet. Okay, so my plan for this hour, and I'm hoping for the break to take place somewhere uh, between, uh, somewhere between these thirds, is to tell you uh, first about uh, the, the two-fold periodicity, complex plot periodicity, uh, and to try to convince you that once you know what the statement is, you're accidentally going to prove it. It just is, it's going to be, whoops, it's, per, it's true, and then you're happy. Uh, and then to make that actually true, you have to define the words in your proof. And so you have to sort of, so the, the definitions come after the proof. And then finally, uh, so some, in the final third that I hope to get to and spend as much time on, but it's, it's getting richer and richer as, as, as we get into it. I want to really get into like the richness of real bot periodicity and then the division of, of uh, and so the first two are with, with, with Hannah and the last uh, is with Jim. But please do stop me with questions because I want the words to make sense. And when I use fancy words, uh, fancy symbols that you haven't seen, they're not so fancy. I'm happy to tell you what it is. Yeah, uh, okay, great. Jim, is that Jim? Ah, so I see there are comments, but I'm gonna ignore them. So honor to tell me. Uh, uh, and there should be a cross Z perhaps somewhere. Uh, Jim's gonna say perhaps. Ah, great. So great. So my, my first goal is to is uh, is to take you from is to figure out what this means and make sense of uh, bot periodicity where we're gonna take loops one from you uh, from you and and to be you. And let me just start to get us into something I feel happier. I don't like the unitary group because I don't understand what it is. But the uh, over the complex numbers, the the uh, GLN deform retracts on U of n, and this is something I knew in first year of college, and I forgot ever since. Uh, which is that you can. So I'm just pleased to remember that you can. And I hope I get this right. You can factor a matrix, any invertible matrix, into a unitary matrix and an upper triangular matrix, uh, and that's uh, using the Gram Schmidt process. And that then you can homotope your upper triangular matrix to be the identity. And so that means you can deformation retract uh, uh, the general linear group, the matrices into the unitary group. So basically what that means is I can replace U of n everywhere by GLN. And now suddenly I'm in a happier algebraic world that I can understand. So what do I mean by GL when I didn't say GL of anything? Well, I, it's going to be a GL infinity in some sense. So GL1 sits in GL2 sits in GL3 and so forth in the, ob, in the quote, obvious way. So, uh, so for example, two by two invertible matrices sit inside three by three invertible matrices by just nestling them in and putting uh, zeros and one there. And so GL is uh, technically, it's a co-limit of GLNs. But if you want to think of elements of GL, then you should think of them as being things that are invertible finite matrices and just fill them out with uh, infinite, Infinite, uh, with the rest of being like some infinite matrix. So it's not really scary at all. Or if you want, think finite matrix, and ju but just be agnostic about what the size. This looks like a two by two matrix, but I'm allowed to think of it as a 10 by 10 matrix, just not as a one by one. So that's what GL is. It's nothing scary. It's the way we normally tame infinity. And so what's BGLN? Uh, so this is one where the algebraic geometers in the audience will be happy and the non other people may be less happy which is it's the moduli space in some sense of vector bundles. I should say this slightly differently, but what I really mean is it's a space that parameterizes that tells us what the vector bundles are in any other space. Uh, so what are the rank n vector bundles on a space X? Uh, well, the rank n vector bundles on X are exactly the maps from X to BGL. That's, so that's what that space is. And so as an example, if I have a map point to BGLN, what's a vector bundle on a point? That just a vector space. And let me say that vector space, let's say it's u. Uh, u is going to, for example, this might be, uh, this is some dimension in vector space. And now what if I had a, uh, if I map x to bgln, and let's say it factored through that point map. Well, that means which rank n vector bundle is, it's the one coming from here, which is it's the pulled back, it's a trivial vector bundle with fiber u. So that's, so that's what bgln is. 
And then uh, if you ask me a little more what I mean by space, because I'm being careful about carefully not saying what I mean by space, I would zoom in and say, BGLN is an art and stack, but don't let that, uh, uh, nowhere will that be, nowhere uh, uh, should that slow you down. I don't say nowhere will that be relevant. But if you think that should cause you concern, just stop and ask me and I will, uh, uh, and tell me anything, tell me your worries and I will try to put your worries to rest. But it's just a, it's a space, it has a topological, if you're over the complex numbers, it can have a homotopy type if you like that. If it's if you're over uh, a field, it can have a chow ring. It's it's a very uh, don't worry about the fact that it's not a in the same way that so an algebraic geometer dealing with varieties will tell uh, a differential geometer don't worry about what a variety is. It's you basically know what it is. It's the same thing with stacks. Okay, so maybe I'll stop and ask if there's anything stack wise. Anything maybe I shouldn't stop, uh, but uh, tell me if there's anything you feel nervous about about this so far. Okay, so let me get, let me just get some practice with the concept. So here's a map from BGLN to BGLN plus one, uh, which is going, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna take the map corresponding to, uh, if I have a map from X to BGLN, I need to give you a recipe. Uh, if I give you a vector bundle of rank N, I'm gonna give you a recipe for a vector bundle of rank N plus one. And my recipe is gonna be add the trivial bundle. So that recipe is the data of this map. So that so this map is add trivial. I've defined this map to be add trivial bundle, the rank one. Okay, now we're ready for Bob periodicity. So Bob periodicity says loops two of BGL, and we know what BGL is now. It's a space of these vector bundles. Should give me a. a I, I want to say that, that is going to be the same as BGL, and there's a Z here, which Jim pointed out in the comments, and. Maybe let me not worry about that and I can explain what that Z is later. But let me explain more importantly, now that we know what BGL is, it's basically vector bundles, what is this loops two? Well, when I see loops two and I put myself in the mind of a topologist, loops two is a based, means it's a map from a sphere with a chosen point. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a based map from a sphere. So it's a sphere with a marked point mapping to BGL. But when I see a sphere with a marked point, that looks to me like CP1. So, uh, and so, and if I want to be sophisticated and think algebra geometrically and not be hung up on what field I'm thinking about, I'll just call it P1. So what I'm gonna say is that I wanna just consider maps of P1 to BGL with a marked point infinity. And that's what it's gonna be. And if you want me to go back to topology land, I just say, no problem. We work over the complex numbers. We specialize in the complex numbers. Uh, and so, so now what I'm saying is this is maps of P1 with a mark point P infinity mapping to this thing. And now I made this into an algebra, now this is an algebra geometric statement. I have a, I know what this object is. I know what this object is. I just need to figure out what the map is and show it's an isomorphism. And for experts who know about these things, with the way I've defined it, this is the affine grass money. So it's a sign that, you know, we're on the right track that we've, we're discussing something fundamental. Okay. So our goal is to define this map beta, this bot map beta, and show it's an isomorphism. So in other words, the bot map beta was supposed to be a map from loops two of BGL to B BGL. And what that means, to show you what the map, to figure out what the, to define the map, it means that anytime I give you a map to loops two of BGL, and I'll translate this into English in a second, I get a map to BGL. So the translation, in, okay, maybe this is in English, but it's is into uh, it's out of topology language. If so, if if I give you a vector bundle on, uh, and I'm agnostic about its rank, I give you a vector bundle on P1 cross X. So we've got X, and I give you a vector bundle on P1 cross X. Uh, you've got to give me a recipe to give me a bundle on X. That's what I'm asking for. So uh, and and so let me say that again. You give me, I want a recipe. I, uh, so uh, uh, the recipe says, if I give you an X uh, and uh, P1 cross X uh, and a vector bundle on P1 cross X, give me a bundle on X. Well, how would you do it? And maybe I feel like I want to ask if there's a, like, an idea. Like there's no, I don't want the perfect idea. I just want a reasonable guess as to how you would get a bundle on P1 cross X and turn it into a bundle on X. Just use the mark point, right? Ah, that's a great, you could pull it back. 
So uh, uh, great. So one, one way of doing it is you would use a mark point. And so there's your section. Let me call it section S. And you could pull back this bundle. And now if we want it to be trivialized, this should be a trivial bundle. So one way to do it is by pulling back the mark point and we should get the trivial bundle. So now I want a different way to get a different bundle potential. Actually, I should say that, that was just a pi naught versus pi two. And so if I give you a bundle on P1, uh, right. So, uh, and I feel like if I asked the right leading question, I, I shouldn't ask that. No, I, I think that was already a good idea. Any other good ideas that, that, like that? Would it be possible to uh, remove the section and yeah. then take something which is like C invariant and descend? Mm -hmm. So uh, great. So 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 Nicholas saying remove the section. So the intuition is to remove the section, and he's somehow saying remove the part that was trivial and see what's left. So uh, and uh, I want to extract from that something like a derived category kind of idea. Of what he's trying to is. But uh, great. So we have a part of this bundle is going to be the base point. And then we have the rest of it is going to be, uh, we want to sort of do some drive category thing where we remove the trivial bundle. Okay, that's a good idea. That's, uh, and, uh, and so that idea is in the right sense correct as well. So I don't know if it's worth taking even, a, I can think of at least two other correct answers that are equivalent that sound different. Uh, so yeah, so th that answer will be correct as you will see in a second. But maybe don't stop yet if anyone wants a different, has a different uh, idea. Let me say, okay, let me just say one, maybe I'm more naive. Like I would have thought, so if I were, so my naive idea would be push it forward. If the bundle is generated by global section, you just push it forward and you get a vector bundle downstairs. But if I were fancy, uh, I would say something uh, would this be fancier than Nicola's answer? I would say, yeah, this is, so the next level fancy is beyond Nicola's answer would be some sort of drive category push forward or some sort of lower shriek. And so if you put those four answers together, all four are sort of correct. You take Nicola's answer is subtracting out, I, I, I didn't catch him, he said the first answer, uh, and you subtract out the trivial, you're taking the push forward minus the trivial is gonna be exactly what it is. So let me, let me, uh, tell you the answer in the, in the first case, and then you can translate it to the others. So you have a vector bundle on P1. One thing you may know about vector bundles on P1 is that they are direct sums of line bundles uh, of O of AIs. And so maybe, okay, if, if it's non-negative, uh, by which I mean, if each of these guys is, some, each of the sum ends is non-negative or generally a global section, some different ways of saying it, one way of getting a bundle, and this is unlike the answers that you suggested, this example does not, this idea just doesn't work all the time. Uh, but if it happens to be non-negative on a big open set where it's non-negative, then we get a bundle. Uh, and that would, and so that's great. And then I, I give you a bundle. Uh, and so there's a problem with what I'm saying. Uh, actually, yeah, there's a problem with the three answers so far, all of which go away when you think about it, which is we are agnostic about the rank of, of the bundle. So what if instead of E, we added a trivial bundle? Because those are supposed to count. We're supposed to be agnostic about, we're supposed to be able to add trivial bundles and that counts as the same bundle. And all, in this answer, when you push it forward, E plus O, you push forward E and the trivial bundle and you get the push forward of E in the trivial bundle. And so when you adjust it in a trivial way that wasn't supposed to count, the output, you get basically the same bundle. And if you did the same thing with the, if you pay attention to the two suggestions, they also play well with respect to adding trivial bundles. So, so we get a well-defined bundle. Uh, we get a well-defined push forward. Now, what sucks with my idea, but not with the other ones, was what if E was not positive and couldn't just push it forward? Well, what you do, if you have a bundle that's not positive and you wish it were, you just twist it up to make it positive. So you'd instead say twist up by K and make it positive. And, uh, and, so the, and then you'd be happy uh, maybe you'd be unhappy because you realize you have to twist up infinitely much to make every bundle work. But you could, you could instead, all I need to check is that if I, when I twist it up, I get the same answer. In other words, all I really need to check is that if I push forward E of minus one, or you have K minus one, I get the same as pushing forward E of K. So if that were true, well, it's not true, then we would get the same push forward. However, when we push it 
let me just write this down. You take a short exact sequence. We have the bundle. Uh, we, we have the bundle twisted by minus one. We have the bundle, and we when we push forward. And actually, here we have the very first. That is, this is the very first suggestion that we got as to how to get a bundle on the base. It was pulled back the section from infinity, and now that's the trivial bundle. So the bundle we get by pushing forward e or e of minus one are the same bundle, just they're extended by a trivial bundle. It's not a direct sum, but it's essentially a direct sum. You can like that's there's an extension class you can send to zero. So up to homotopy is basically the same thing. So okay, so what that means is uh, let me just go back a second. We now have a well-defined map uh, from uh, this. That's our beta. I said it in terms of. Take, just take your family, twist it up, and push it forward. Uh, Nicola said it by uh, remove the infinity section, figure out what's going on away from it. Or you could also say it by take the lower shriek in, uh, in K theory. So uh, it, but basically all the answers you try to come up with will give you the right thing. And then the magic is that this map, you now have to find a map from loops two of BGL to BGL. And once Bot tells us there should be such a map, we, we had no choice but to make it. And the magic is that this is a reversible construction. And this is something which uh, is, I, I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's a surprise and this amazing insight. Uh, and one of the, again, the many things about the way mathematics works is, so Leonardo gave the reference to the paper which explained how to think about this the right way. I don't think it's possible he will have no recollection the question was not appreciably, it would not have sounded like this question at all, perhaps. So he has no idea what I'm talking about right now, perhaps. Uh, uh, so, but I want to explain this idea that came from the paper that he said to, that the, to look, he told, um, told us to look at. Uh, and it's going to be three pages. And there's like a lot of insight here. So I hope you stick with me. But if you don't, you can come back in three pages. OK, so I want to tell you how to describe a moduli space of vector bundles on P1. Uh, oh, I should say the name present here is Stroma. Uh, the, the, uh, this is distilled. I don't know what the Stroma would recognize what I'm about to say. But, uh, and I also feel like this is so fundamental that I'm sure people knew it before Stroma, but I don't know where it was said and in what way. Uh, but uh, so, okay, so consider vector bundles on P1. And, uh, and I want the vector bundles what, uh, to be rank n, fix the rank, fix the degree just for concreteness. And let's make them non-negative in the way that I said. So the sum ends are all positive. So E is a bunch of uh, positive things. Uh, and that means by Riemann rock that we know how many sections E has and E twisted by minus one. So, uh, and so let me just call this vector space A. We have a vector space of dimension dn and a vector space of dimension d plus one n, which are just my global sections of my vector bundle. And so I just want to give that one a name. And again, our, we've required that it be trivialized at infinity. We have this base point. We're requiring that this vector bundle over P1 over infinity is this fixed bundle U. So uh, of, uh, of rank N, we have a rank N thing. So, so far, I've given you the data of a dense open subset of our space of bundle rank N bundles on P1 of degree D. My, open because I required that they be positive, that they be. Uh, that, that all the sum ends be non negative. And I'm going to add one more bit of information. This is something Jim calls section framing. Uh, and so I also further, this is generated by global sections. There's sections of our vector bundle, which give me all my, uh, give me, uh, there's sections of the vector bundle, which give me all the elements of my vector space over infinity. And I'm just going to choose a, a, a splitting, a section of that map. So I'm going to, I just want to map from U to my space of sections. And I just want to point out that because this is a surjective map, this is not a serious addition I'm making. All I have a surjection of vector spaces, then asking for a map in the other direction is like an affine bundle. So if I'm doing topology, it's a, I'm choosing an element of a vector space. The choice is topologically contractible. So I'll add that one extra bit of information. And now I come to uh, something which I think of as uh, the sort of coming up again and again in math, which is, Anytime something is complicated, like a moduli space, you want it to turn into linear algebra. Uh, and, uh, and so I claim 
that I can recover, Iowa claims, Stroma claims, that I can recover my vector bundle from linear algebra, linear algebra data, from the following uh, quiver, uh, uh, quiver or linear algebra description. So, uh, so I, I claim I can recover from the following thing. I've got a vector space, and, and look at my the part that's in red. I've got a vector space of dimension dn, and I've got a vector space, a fixed vector space of dimension n. So pick for me, uh, so choose any uh, endomorphism of A and any map from A to U. Uh, and so now I'm going to tell you what E is. I'm going to build E by taking the trivial bundle on P1, A underline, and the trivial bundle on P1, U underline, and I'll map A to A plus U by uh, okay, what's this map going to be? It's like it's degree one, so I need to like put coordinates on P1. So I, that part's identity on A. Uh, did I screw that up? No, no, I didn't. Uh, I feel like I screwed it up. No, no, that's right. Good. So that's it. The map to the A is going to be the identity times x naught minus alpha times x1. That tells me the map from this part to this part. My map from here to U is just J times x1. So Again, the magic is that this works, and I'm not. And uh, uh, so we have an open condition that this should be that the co-kernel of whatever this map is should be a vector bundle. That's an open condition, and the magic is this recovers e. And to prove it, it's just a calculation. You just check. Look, it recovers e. It just worked. We already know what a was. We already know what u was. I can tell you what j and alpha was. The actual proof is a triviality once you know it's true. But I have no idea in my gut how you would have how I would have invented it. So let me say it again. The data of a vector bundle of this sort is nothing more than a vector space A, a vector space U, these two maps, and that's it. That's some open condition. And how do I recover E? It's a whole kernel of this map. How do I reverse it? Well, you already know what it is. Uh, well, I can tell you how to. I can. I can tell you how to reverse it. So that. So any. So the translation again of what this is, this is my third and final page about this, this trick is that the space of such vector bundles is just the space of matrices. Uh, it's a linear space, uh, affine space, except it's an open subset. So some explicit condition, modulo the uh, uh, GL. Translation two is uh, uh, equivalently the space we're looking at, uh, uh, the space of bundles that are, that are uh, non-negative is an affine bundle, an open subset of an affine bundle of the BGL. And translation three, which is the way Stroma would say it, which is that you take your bundle, it's generated by global sections. This is for the algebraic geometries. It's generated by global sections. So it turns, so that means that there's this rejection like this. What's the kernel? The kernel is you push forward E of minus one, pull it back, twist it by minus one, and that's what it is. And that's, it looks different, but all these three things are different ways of saying the same thing. But the upshot is that as you twist and twist and twist, you get uh, bigger and bigger opens and affine bundles over the BGL. And the result is that uh, this, the result is that uh, is that beta is nice one. Beta gives you uh, a nice one. So just to sum up what happened, or what I, all I want you to remember what happened is we figured out what the map was cheaply. We just guessed what it had to be, one of the two directions. This is the map that Bot came up with. In history, Atia came up with a map in the opposite direction. And this one, uh, uh, what we have to do is we just rely on this bit of magic which comes up repeatedly later on. Okay, so that is, so now we are at about 1.30 or 4.30. So I, so let me, before calling for a break, let me just say that, that, that I wanna say that that concludes a proof of bot periodicity with the one caveat that what I said doesn't necessarily make sense because none of the words, I, I didn't say what any of the words meant. So what is about to happen after the break is I will say what I meant. And, and then the words I make up are designed to make the proof just work without any change. And then I can declare victory. And it's not cheating because I actually, as a consequence, get the classical, get all these statements that you want to actually take place. So you basically say, here's what I, the properties I need to have true, make the definitions work, and look, every part of the argument makes sense there. So that's what's gonna happen um, after we have some questions and I'm fine a break. Is that a good time, Anders? For uh, yes, this yeah. is excellent. Yes, very nice. Um, yeah, before we have the break, uh, any quick questions to Ravi?
I don't see anything in the chat and I don't hear anything, but yeah, it was very nice and clear. All right, let's see. Um, 